This is a studio version of a lecture given at Nagoya University on March the 17th, 2018. I'd like to start by making a few comments about the challenges facing us as teachers of literature today. The fact that uh, we are in a shrinking field and a field that is under attack. Part of the attack is political. We're in the Japanese context here, so I'll talk about it from a Japanese point of view, but this kind of thing could apply in many countries around the world. Here we've got the education minister a couple of years ago telling universities, telling the national universities that they should scrap departments and courses devoted to humanities and social sciences, on top of which a member of the Industrial Com Competitiveness Committee, which advises the government on these kinds of things, came out with, or somebody on that committee, somebody not named in the uh, reporting, came out with the statement that students majoring in the humanities and social sciences should be taught the skills of orally translating between Japanese and English rather than reading Shakespeare's works, which is a, a very direct attack specifically on the teaching of English literature. Now there was a big groundswell of protest against what the government was coming out with at that time, but even so we can see that the number of seats in humanities and social science courses is going down. It went down by over a thousand in 2017 and uh, science courses are, places on science courses are increasing. In addition to the political challenges, there are challenges from the multi-dollar publishing industry. We know what we want to teach as teachers of literature, I hope we know. We want to teach works like these. And all too often, we are being expected to teach works like these. So we're under threat, not just uh, politically, but also uh, from policy makers and publishers within the English teaching world who feel that simplified versions are quite enough for our students to be going on with. We, of course, want to get those uh, simplified versions out of the way and focus on original texts. But all too often, we're finding that even uh, within the context of the establishments that we're working in, we're being expected to uh, work with a lower level, a much lower level of textual input. I'm not quite sure how widespread that is, but I think it's certainly something that, that, that I've seen and observed going on. Uh, we therefore find that we are under threat from, sometimes from our own fellow teachers, uh, the, the language teaching community and the literature teaching community as discourse communities are not always on the same page and do not always share the same ideology. Here's a, an example from a, a fairly recent publication which talks about the problems associated with using original texts from literature. Uh, admittedly, it does say at the beginner and inter intermediate level, uh, but I would, I would want to question really the appropriateness of using simplified texts, except in very limited contexts, perhaps like mm, teaching a course to mechanical engineering students where perhaps the teacher might opt for a, a simplified version of a, a classical work of literature or something like that. But the main thing that I'd want to pick out from our point of view is the way that the EFL teacher here sees it as a question of problems which can be avoided in this case by using simplified texts, whereas we, I think as teachers of literature, would want to say, no, it's not a problem to be avoided, it's a challenge to be overcome. And the next area of challenge or threat to 
our uh, work as teachers of literature, the students themselves. A very recent report shows that we've got more than half of university students not actually reading books for pleasure. According to the report, 53.1% of students do not read books, either online or otherwise. And the number of students who don't read is increasing pretty fast, 4% since the year before and up 18.6% over five years. This is a if, if this keeps on going, there won't be anybody reading in 20 years' time. This is a big thing. And students specifically in the humanities are, again, voting with their feet. 48.6% of them don't actually read. We are failing if we look at those figures, if we think that that's really the measure of our success then we'd have to say, well, we're not succeeding. We are somehow missing the boat here. So something needs to be done because we are threatened by our own students who are increasingly turning away from books. Well, part of that, again, is not just about uh, the students. It's about the, the world that those students are living in Although I've said that uh, online texts are not being read as well as texts uh, in books, the nature of reading has changed. And this is, this is probably the biggest challenge, the biggest threat uh, that uh, literature is facing. The fact that, as Will Self puts it, deep serious reading and serious writing is under threat from the digital revolution. It's not that the web will make our culture more stupid, but it will lead to new forms of understanding. When reading came in with the ancient Greeks, they thought it was the end of civilization because people weren't using their brains to remember things the way they did. If it was all written down, they would come to depend on the written word instead of uh, keeping things uh, alive in their in their minds and in their memories and to a certain extent that was true in fact to a very great extent it was true and in the same way now as reading is going out we are bewailing the end of civilization and we shouldn't be it's not just that it's going to make us more stupid it's going to lead to new forms of understanding but the challenge here is can we incorporate the best of our literary tradition in the digital context? How can we carry over the richness of the culture that we've got and make it relevant and applicable to the digital age? This is something that we, it's big, it's as big as Gutenberg, maybe bigger. We haven't been through anything like this for hundreds of years. And it's a challenge that we as literature teachers need to face. The focus of my presentation is on the role of the text and putting the text in its right place. And I'd like to get right to that point straight away. I don't want to say that the simplified text doesn't have any relevance to our teaching or to students learning. It's a tool. It has its place. And like all tools, if it's used in the right way, it can be of positive value. So can translations and summaries of the kind that we'll find in Spark Notes and uh, Cliff's Notes and that sort of online website, dictionaries, of course, blogs, audiobooks, videos, encyclopedias, including Wikipedia, and even Wikipedia in Japanese. All of these things can be of some value if they're used as resources but we can also get into a lot of confusion with them. How are we going to 
harness the resource appropriately and <laughs> you probably know where I'm coming from here we need to put the text first the text needs to be central the complete and unabridged text as long as we have the complete unabridged text central to our uh, courses, to our syllabus, to the uh, curriculum, then all these other things serve as ways of getting a handle on the text. And that's a very, very important perspective from which to see all the uh, sub secondary resources, as long as they are f filtered through the centrality of the text, then the, the use of them should fall into place. And we shouldn't really judge students. If, if a student says, well, the, the only way I can really approach the text is through a translation, then that's what works for that student. If another student says, well, I find that uh, watching the movie really helps me, then fine, that's great. Um, and if a student says, well, the best I can do is read Wikipedia, um, then at least you want to try and say, okay, well, <laughs> that, that gives you a very basic introduction to the book. Have you thought of moving on to uh, something like, uh, you know, Spark Notes, so that you get the, at least a summary chapter by chapter rather than Wikipedia, which just gives you an overview. So you, you, you'll, you'll basically uh, be allowing students well you couldn't stop them could you uh, you <laughs> but but you you won't be trying to put students off from using these resources you'll be encouraging them insofar as uh, they are using those resources to try to get some kind of handle on the text similarly the text needs to be central to concerns like the author's life uh, dodgson uh, lewis carroll is not important to us because he was a mathematician or because of what he had for breakfast is important to us as the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and the historical and cultural context in which he lived again is not relevant to, a, to us in itself we want to focus we want to bring that historical and cultural information to bear on the text and the text is not simply an example of a genre. It's important in relation to other texts, but the focus needs to be on the text itself. And equally, critical responses and interpretations would be futile if we were not familiar with the text. So the centrality of the text is of paramount importance. And when it comes to student skills, the main reading is the text. The main discussion is relating to the text. The main research is research about the text. And the presentation, whether it takes the form of PowerPoint presentations or online presentations of various kinds or term papers and reaction papers and so on, is focused on the text. So I think if we keep the text central and we make no apology for it, because that's what we do. We, as teachers of literature, that's what we do and that's what we should be doing. We should not be compromising on that in any way. Uh, despite the threats that literature is under and the teaching of literature is facing, we should not be compromising. We should be firmer than ever, in fact, that the text, the original unabridged text, is central to what we are doing as teachers of literature. Now, what I'm saying here is basically about literature, but it could be applied, I think, to teachers of current affairs, teachers of media studies, teachers of a variety of other fields. So uh, I hope that uh, those people who are listening to this, who are perhaps not teaching literary texts in the same way as I am and that I'm talking about, will find that uh, a lot of this is relevant to what they're doing as well. So here's a very clear example of the absolute necessity to 
deal with the authentic text because really what else could substitute for the long and sad tale of the mouse here? Fury said to a mouse that he met in the house, let us both go to law, I will prosecute you. Come, I'll take down to dial, we must have the trial, for really this morning I've nothing to do. Said the mouse to the cur, such a trial, dear sir, with no jury or judge would be wasting our breath. I'll be judge, I'll be jury, said cunning old Fury, I'll try the whole cause and condemn you to death. Without seeing the text laid out on the page like that, we would have no possible way of understanding the point of the long, sad tale that the mouse is talking about. So that's a very clear visual example, but I would say that that applies all the way through. There is nothing that will really substitute for the authentic text. All right, now I've said that there are uh, areas of conflict or difference between teachers of literature and teachers of language. And one of the big problems that we have is the term extensive reading, which does not in the world of English language teaching mean quite what we might think it means. All too often, extensive reading is assumed to be connected with Creation and his comprehensible input. And in turn, that leads inevitably to graded readers and simplified texts, which I, I think I've made pretty clear so far. I'm not really, uh, that's not the road I'm going down. So I would like to see extensive reading with the meaning of reading extensively, leading to being well read. And that is the route that as literature teachers, we should be taking, or that's what I feel we should be doing. So I'd like to explain a little bit about how one particular resource gets misused and leads to a misunderstanding about extensive reading and how we can extensively read original authentic texts that are not being graded or simplified in any way. Students will almost inevitably, I think, when asked how to read a, a book, a text, and deal with unknown vocabulary, put up their hands with uh, the excited certainty that they've got the right answer and say, yes, yes, when I come across a word that I don't know, I should look in the dictionary. And that's going to lead to a page that looks something like this. And that is exactly what we want to prevent. Looking at that page in a little bit more detail, we might see things like, for example, a wink of sleep there. And the students saying, well, wink, I, I, I actually checked this one and, and a wink, I know what it means, but, but I don't understand what a wink of sleep means. So going to the dictionary really was just a waste of time for the student. Or here, the pigeon went on without attending to her. But it's not attending in the sense that people are attending the conference. Uh, people are coming to a meeting, attending. It means without paying attention, without listening to her. So the dictionary has actually given the wrong answer and had a negative effect on the student's understanding of the text, on the reader's understanding. Or take that expression, there's no pleasing them. Every single word can be understood, but the overall meaning may be elusive. So a dictionary is not necessarily the right tool, or the, the way of using the dictionary may not be the right way of using that tool. Checking everything is pretty much going to lead to uh, smudged pages full of marginal notes. And if you're like me and you go to uh, used bookshops, you'll see books like that, and they've got all those markings on the first page. And you turn over the page and, yes, on the second page, the third page. Sometimes right through to the end of the first chapter, sometimes even the first 50 pages or so. But have you ever seen a book that's been marked like that right through to the end? 
I haven't. The reader almost inevitably gives up before getting to the end of the book. Because that is not the right way to be reading. Apart from anything else, think about the message that's being put across here. The message is, focus on what you don't understand. Check what you don't understand. And what kind of a message is that to be giving people? Shouldn't they be looking at it positively? Shouldn't they be thinking about what they do understand? Now, I can illustrate that much more effectively by taking an everyday communicative Situ communicative situation. John going into an izakaya. And what do I find? Well, if I've been taking Japanese lessons, uh, I might be expecting uh, so the sort of okuni wa dochira desu ka? And uh, where, where do you come from? And answering these questions in a civilized and uh, very comprehensible sort of matter. But, but real life isn't going to be like that. I'm going to walk in and there's going to be some half-drunk ojisan who's going to uh, start talking to me in a fashion something like, to my, ear, to my ears, it's going to sound something like this. I'm going to be absolutely flummoxed. I have not understood enough to be able to join in or to, to make any kind of response to what he's saying. I've picked out one or two isolated words, but most of it has just gone way over my head. Am I going to ask for comprehensible input? Am I going to try and check every word in the dictionary? Because that's not going to work. Okay, I'm just going to be told, You can't speak Japanese, can you? All right, and the conversation is going to dry up. The guy's going to find something else, someone else to talk to, uh, and something else to do. He's going to, I'm going to be left sitting in a corner on my own. No, the only possible approach in this kind of situation is not to try to understand what I don't understand, but try to pick out what I do understand. Tolerance of non-comprehension is far more important than comprehensible input. I have to let the guy carry on talking a little bit, smile encouragingly and let him carry on. And I'm in. I'm in, because I've picked out, out of all the mumbled syllables and things that I can't really put together to make any sense of in my head, I've picked out Gendai no Wagamama na Wakamono, the selfish young people today. And that gives me an in. It gives me the opportunity to come back at him. I can say something about the fact that I teach young people and I don't think they're so selfish, or I can say whatever uh, relating to the uh, statement that I've understood coming from his... Uh, rather blurred, perhaps, uh, with the intake of alcohol, his rather blurred lips. So then, of course, he'll come back at me with something else, and there'll be a lot more kind of gabbling and blah, 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 and things I won't understand, and then, then, you know, okay, on the train, everybody's pushing. And, and again, I can say something like, well, you know, on those crowded trains, everybody's pushing. It's not just young people, you know. I mean, I get pushed every day, and quite a lot of them are people of your generation. Or, you know, whatever it is, I can, I can come back and I can, I can hold my own. And even though I haven't understood half or maybe more than half of what he said, I can keep my end up and I can keep the conversation going. And this process of tolerating non-comprehension, rather than asking for comprehensible input. This is something that's really, really important to communicative ability, and it's something that we can get through reading original works of literature. Instead of students focusing on what they don't understand, they simply pick out what they do understand and focus on that, and make, try to make whatever sense they can of what they do understand. So uh, that leads me to another term that's rather misunderstood because of the English language teaching discourse, 
and the way that it uses its jargon, reading for gist, which I am not taking to mean either skimming, that is kind of going through the text very quickly uh, to, to pick out um, so, some particular information, or scanning, uh, again, uh, going through the text, uh, just aiming to pick out particular information. I'm thinking about gist in a, a, di a different kind of way. And so uh, I'm not just reading to get a general sense of context, as in skimming. I'm not reading to, to pick out specified information, as in scanning. scanning. I'm simply trying to get the gist in, in the way that the word might be used more generally uh, outside the English teaching context. So, this is chapter, chapter one. one. Treats Treat of the place, the place where, where Oliver Twist, Twist was, born, was born and of and the of circumstances attending his, attending his birth. birth. Among, Among other, other public, public buildings, buildings in a certain, certain town, town, which for many reasons, reasons it would be prudent to refrain from mentioning, and to which I will assign no fictitious name. There is, there is one, one anciently, anciently common, common to most, most towns, towns, great or small, small to wit, to wit a, workhouse. a workhouse. And in and this, this workhouse, workhouse was born, born on a day and date, date which, I which I need not trouble, trouble myself to repeat, repeat inasmuch as, as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader, in this, in this stage, stage of the business at all events. The item of mortality, whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter. Okay. We're not skimming, we're not scanning, we're reading through reasonably carefully and we just want to pick out the gist, which would be, in this case, the fact that in a certain town there is a workhouse for the first half of the passage. And for the second half of the passage, the fact that the workhouse uh, was the place where a, an, an item of mortality was born. And we'd need to do a bit of figuring out to realise that the item of mortality was Oliver Twist himself. So, in a certain town there is a workhouse, and in this workhouse was born Oliver Twist, which might actually be what you'd find in a simplified version of the text. But the student has had the opportunity to sift that out. And that process of sifting out from so much incomprehensible or very difficult material, sifting out a simple realization, a simple uh, piece of information, that is the kind of skill that uh, is so important to being able to deal with language at the realistic level of everyday life and Continuing with this comprehensible input all the time is not going to help to develop that ability. Let's just carry on a little bit more. For a long, long time, time after it was ushered, ushered into this world, world of sorrow, sorrow and trouble, and trouble by the by parish surgeon, it remained, it remained a matter of considerable doubt, doubt whether, whether the child, the child would, survive would survive to bear any name, name at all. At all. In which, in which case, case it is somewhat, somewhat more than probable, than probable that these, these memoirs, memoirs would never have appeared. appeared. Or, or, if they, if they had, had, that being comprised within a couple of pages, pages they, would they would have possessed the inestimable, inestimable merit of being, of being the, being the most, most concise and faithful specimen of biography extant in the literature of any age or country. That's slightly different in the sense that we can't quite just sort of pick out particular words. We do need to sift through the meaning a little bit more, uh, basically to get to the idea that if Oliver had died at birth, then it would have been a very short book or uh, wouldn't have been written at all. Uh, my point is that the student can read through that passage and get very little out of it, but get something. And particularly by discussion with uh, other students, the idea that Oliver uh, seemed likely to die and that it would have been a very short book if he had died is something that probably between them, with a little bit of discussion, most students of like sort of lower intermediate level 
upwards could probably get hold of. Well, I've already shown bimodal input, uh, so I could just go a little bit into the way that bimodal input is a very, very uh, potentially important part of the new reading, the digital reading that could enhance our teaching. In the computer age, simply we can approach the text in a very, very different way. We can go into Google, search for, for example, Jane Eyre, uh, Gutenberg. There are other databases, but the Gutenberg database is, is a, a very good one. There it is, Project Gutenberg. And let's just take a look. This ebook is for the use of anyone, anywhere, at no cost, and with almost no restrictions whatsoever. How much better does it get? It's free. It's, <laughs> it's accessible. Really, literature should be thriving. So the access to texts is greatly enhanced because there's more reading material, there's more literature up there online than we could ever read in a lifetime. Let's go back to Google and search for something else. LibriVox. Again, there are other databases that would work just as well, databases of audiobooks, but uh, LibriVox is a Again, it's a, it's a good example of that kind of online resource. Free public domain audiobooks. Again, let's go and take a look. Search for Jane Eyre, and we find several different readings of Jane Eyre. Let's take that one, version two. We could either download the whole book as a zip file or subscribe to it by iTunes. See these green uh, buttons on the, on the left-hand side there. Or we can just listen online to the first chapter. Let's do that. Here we go, chapter one. Here it is. And chapter one, chapter Jane, one Eyre. Jane Eyre. This is a LibriVox, this is a LibriVox recording. recording. Okay, and now we go back to the online text, or else we open a book and, and, and re follow the text uh, in the printed book, and we're away. Chapter one. Chapter one. There was no possibility, was no possibility of taking, of a, walk of taking a walk that day. We had been we wondering, had been wondering indeed, indeed, indeed in the leafless shrubbery, shrubbery, an shrubbery an hour, hour in the morning. But since okay. dinner, so Mrs. Reed, when there was with no that company, kind of early, input, the cold winter wind had brought with it clouds pretty so much forced into and a rain so penetrating in the sense that, that further I would like outdoor to exercise was now out term. of the question. They will read, I was glad of it. And they will I never continue liked continue reading. Walk. They will be kept up to speed by the fact that the words keep coming on, coming on through the audio and leading their eye across the page to follow. And that is it, really. That is all. We shouldn't be uh, expecting them to get certain things from the text. We shouldn't be demanding anything of them. It is enough that they simply let their eye wander across the page in time to the audio recording. At most, we could perhaps say, when you get to the end of the chapter, uh, write down some notes uh, about what you've understood. And we might also allow the use of the dictionary once they got to the end of the chapter. If there's anything they particularly want to check, they can. But they've had that experience. They've read a chapter of an original work of English literature, and they have doubtless got something out of it. There will be something that they will have understood, 
even though there'll be a lot that they don't understand. They can bring their notes to the following class or they can bring their impressions to the following class. They can share those notes or uh, verbal uh, discussion of their impressions and they can help each other to come to a more complete understanding of what's in this chapter because what one person has understood another person may not have but that person will have understood something else and they'll put all their partial understandings together to get not a complete understanding of the text of course when does ever uh, when does there ever uh, emerge a complete understanding of a text but but they've got a a, a more filled out kind of comprehension through working together and of course, we've got the uh, the video uh, with, particularly if it's got the English subtitles, we're now talking about, you know, I suppose, trimodal input because you've got the visual image there along with the uh, printed text and the uh, spoken word. So uh, it's particularly good for, for drama, but it's also good for uh, adaptations of novels uh, the students will obviously be aware that some things have been changed in order to uh, adapt it for the screen, but it's very often a good way of consolidating students' understanding of the written text. Okay, this whole way of teaching literature through the centrality of the text can be done from a teacher-centred <laughs> way of teaching, but I would rather see it done through a student-centered approach, meaning something like, well, let's take a look. Something like that opening to Oliver Twist. From a teacher-centered point of view, well, we might pre-teach some of the difficult language. We might in advance, create a set of comprehension questions, which would then take us to, uh, the, the, the form of reading would be more like scanning. Uh, it's the sort of reading that students have, have done for tests. Uh, and, and again, we, in order to get into university in the first place. And again, it's the sort of reading that I'd rather like to get away from. I'd rather it were much more open and that students get whatever they get. The classroom, in a teacher-centered context looks pretty familiar to us, something like this. Whereas in a, a student-centered framework, you're going to be having the students themselves discussing what they understand and don't understand, rather than uh, being pre-taught lexical items. You're going to let them be the ones to ask the questions. And you're going to encourage them to find the answers to the questions in their own way. I mean, one of the ways of getting answers is to ask the teacher, and there's nothing wrong at a certain point in the teacher answering those questions. But they can either talk about it among themselves and say, well, I think it's this, or maybe it's this. They can use the dictionary if they need to. They can use all those resources, simplified texts, go online to try and get the answers. But the text itself is central. And the whole appearance of the classroom changes to something more like this. And that would just be one group inside a classroom. You'd expect there to be three or four groups like that who are sitting and working uh, on the text in that kind of way. So, I don't want to say that the teacher-centered approach is, is always wrong, but I'm going, to, I'm going to say that I'd like to see a move away from it. I'll be coming back later on to what the teacher's role could be in a more teacher-centered kind of context. But uh, for now, I'd like to say, well, I think that this kind of teaching, the kind of work that we're doing is probably better if we make it more student-centered and give students more of a, a role in actively engaging with the text and discussing it among themselves. One of the problems that I find is that in that situation, students are likely quite often to use their own native language. And 
Uh, there are various ways around that. You can have a language policeman in the group, or if necessary, or you can simply uh, get very high levels of motivation going, or whatever. But uh, one thing that I've found works pretty well is to have these kinds of conversations going on in a computer room where the recording is made of what they say and the recording is connect, collected by the teacher. When students know that the teacher can listen in to any of their conversations and that the teacher will then collect their uh, recordings, they're much more likely to uh, stick to English. Uh, and even though it's hesitatingly, they do come out with very useful, very fruitful conversations. In the classroom itself, group work can take the, name, the, the, the shape of encouraging students to, for example, create quiz questions to challenge the rest of the class. So that in their groups, they're thinking up questions that they can challenge the rest of the class with. They make a list of questions and then when the time comes, one group challenges another. Somebody in the first group stands up and challenges the rest of the class and then somebody gets the answer and, and that group then in turn challenges the rest of the class. And uh, as teachers, I mean, I would love to teach without having to give grades or anything, but uh, it we, we would be keeping track of who's doing the questioning and who's doing the answering. And in fact, I will uh, very often keep a sort of score chart, not of the individuals, but of the groups up on the board. And when we reach 10, uh, when a group gets a, a score of 10, that is that group or somebody in that group has answered uh, 10 times correctly, I'll uh, say that that's the end of the quiz. Mm, and I'll be keeping record one way or another of who are the individuals who are answering, because that's going to tell me who is really engaging with the text, who's getting to grips with this. Uh, as I say, <laughs> I wish I didn't have to grade them at all very often in, on these courses, but since it's got to be done, uh, that's part of the process. And then we move on into written work. I find that things like Moodle or uh, in this case, blogger, a private blog, the students have to be invited and they can put up their ideas, their plans for writing their paper or their ideas about the text. And I can slip in comments as well. And again, we got these now rather more formalized discussions, formalized because they're written down and students can go back to them at any stage. We've got these discussions going on that are very helpful in terms of developing students' uh, understanding of the text and the sophistication of their understanding, getting them to interact and exchange ideas relating to the text, and prepare the way for uh, presentations of various kinds. One kind of presentation would be the uh, PowerPoint presentation, this sort of thing. I'm going to talk about the meaning of marriage for women in 19th century. The of for women in 19th century. During the Victorian period, there was shortly defined the role of men and there women. Was defined role of men and women. First, men should work for family to First, earn money men and should work their for family to earn money like and that. support their food, causes something like that. Men were expected to be breadwinners of family. Breadwinners means a person who earn money to support their family. Breadwinners means a person who earn money to support their family. It is similar to a common idea that dichotomous work is not a man. It is similar to a common idea that dichotomous work is not a man. It is similar to a common idea that dichotomous work is not a man. Also, men needed to make sure that the women were paid. So, her voice is a little bit quiet, but I think we could get the sense there of how she's put together some information that gives a useful kind of background to the cultural context of the 19th century novel that she's working on, which in this case actually was Jane Eyre. And uh, we get also online presentations, online written presentations. Uh, in this case, uh, a group of them talked about uh, or focused on, worked on, uh, religion, education and feminism in the 19th century using uh, a kind of software called 
Evernote. And let's take a look at the education group here. Okay, one of the slides is on education at the end of the 19th century, um, showing how uh, education was changing over that period. It's useful for them. It gives them a, a chance to do a little bit of writing that approaches academic writing of, of their own and and get things like giving notes, uh, references to, to sources and that kind of that kind of writing, which will prepare them for writing a term paper later on. And as a final example of student centered learning, here is um, something that students did on a snowy day back in January. About half the class didn't turn up, uh, which I had more or less anticipated. So I thought they might like to work on Hardy's poem, The Voice, which they illustrated between them like this. Woman much missed how you call to me, call to me, saying that now you are not as you were when you had changed from the one who was all to me, but as at first, when our day was fair. Can it be you that I hear? Let me view you then, standing as when I drew near to the town where you would wait for me. Yes, as I knew you then, even to the original air blue gown or is it only the breeze in its listlessness brought across the wet mead to me here you being ever dissolved to one wistlessness heard no more again far or near thus i faltering forward leaves around me falling wind oozing thin through the leaves from norward and the woman calling Okay, so <clears throat> in addition to student-centered activities, obviously there is a point at which teacher guidance is necessary. So what kind of teacher guidance would I go for? So if we look at Hardy's poem, I'll just go through the first stanza. The students will normally spend the initial period of time with a poem looking at the content, looking at how they visualize it and what they think is going on in it without focusing on technique. Technique in a lot of ways is a negative, destructive way of looking at poetry and if we focus on it in the wrong way it's a little bit like saying something like, oh I've, I've just met somebody I, I think um, really nice person and <laughs> Well, tell me about that person. Well, they've got six meters of daicho, of large intestine, and oh, eight liters of blood, and 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 you say, wait a minute, that isn't that isn't what I want to know. When you talk about a person, that doesn't really tell me the kinds of things that I I, I was expecting you to about that person, what that person's like, and why you like that person. So, in the same way, technique can pretty much murder to dissect, but at a certain stage also it can be useful because in the same way as a pop song has music to convey its effects, for a poem it's simply the techniques that are there on the page. There is no music to carry it along. If you've got music like So sa boku da wa sekai ni tatsu, you know, you've got the, the, the melody that carries the atmosphere, the sense of sort of triumph and, and everything is there in the music. Uh, if you were to change it into a rap song, it goes So sa boku da wa you know, I mean, it would completely change it, wouldn't it? It would change the atmosphere of the song. So in the same way, uh, students can become interested in the techniques that the poet uses because uh, they can see how that is helping to shape the atmosphere of the poem. So uh, if I were to present them with the idea of alliteration, most of them would be able to pick out that, for example, at the beginning of the poem there, you've got woman much missed, you've got those repeated M's. 
and they would also choose it by default if you gave them something like woman gap missed and, and just left a gap there and gave them a choice of words to put in woman so missed woman very missed woman i missed or whatever they would pick much pretty much or every time woman much missed and the way that that works to emphasize the fact that he misses her becomes apparent to them they can see that they need a bit of guidance to get them there because it's uh, it's a little bit more specialized than just visualizing the the, the poem as a kind of picture but it's uh, i think and it's an important part of poetry and it's worth presenting it to students repetition again how you call to me call to me well they have no difficulty finding it and what's important about it is the effect of it, the way that it gives a sense of her calling him again and again. And then the three syllable rhyme, call to me, all to me. The echo effect, call to me, call to me, all to me. The way that uh, there's a kind of echo effect being created in that particular case. So they can relate the technique to the atmosphere uh, of the poem, they can see the effect of the technique. So it's not just about technique, it's about the fact that the technique has an effect. And uh, that's something that takes a bit of teacher guidance in order to enable the students to see it. Rhythm and rhyme, again, it's quite a lot of usually fun for students to sit down and pick out the rhythm, dum de dee dum de dee dum de dee dum de dee Woman much missed how you call to me, call to me. And the A rhyme, okay? Saying that now you are not as you were. dum de dee dum de dee dum de dee dum And these are different rhymes, so the different end lines, so end sounds. So they, they pick uh, B, it's a B rhyme. Then uh, when you had changed from the one who was all to me with a A rhyme again, and the same dum de dee dum de dee dum de dee dum de dee And then... Uh, but as at first when our day was fair, with a, a B. But, again, with a bit of guidance or talking it through with them, we'll pretty soon get to the fact that there's a missing syllable there in that fourth line, instead of it dum de dee dum de dee dum de dee dum saying that now you are not as you were, in that last line it's dum de dee dum de dee dum de dum There's a missing syllable there. Okay, but as at first when our day was fair. And also, the rhyme, although it's close, saying that now you are not as you were, uh, but as at first when our day was fair, it's not a complete rhyme, it's a half rhyme. So, unless we assume that Hardy just wasn't very good at rhythm and rhyme, we're going to have to say, well, this is part of the effect that he's creating, and it focuses on the word fair, but as at first when our day was fair. The rhyme is not perfect with were, and the rhythm is uh, breaking down slightly at that point. So it focuses attention on fair and has a, a particular effect. So the negative feel of the poem is being uh, developed in the early part of the poem with the complicated timeline and, and so on. And the way that complication is used as a way of expressing something negative because if we if it's complicated we're obviously going to have a negative reaction towards it and then uh, our day was fair it stands out as being simple easy to understand but also it's in contrast to the sense of absence and anxiety that we've got in the rest of the first stanza and this word is emphasized by these two techniques by the rhyme and the rhythm and it shows that the atmosphere of the poem is going to change that sort of thing would need a bit of teacher guidance to get students going on it. Equally with Oliver Twist, that first paragraph has got so many pompous sounding words. It will be prudent to refrain from mentioning. I will assign no fictitious name. And uh, in as much as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader and so on. And it all comes out in contrast to the item of mortality, the little baby, the helpless little baby that's be, that's born. And it's a, a very good example of anticlimax. 
So it's a good way to present students with the idea of a literary technique of building something up with a lot of a fanfare. <laughs> It's Chibi Maruko Chang. Okay, so with a bit of teacher guidance, they can learn the idea of what the author might be about there, what the author might be aiming for in terms of building up a, a rather pompous set of circumstances and then putting this little item of in, immortality in there as a, as a contrast. And in the same way, in the second paragraph, it's the the fact that it would be a concise and faithful specimen of biography if Oliver were to die at the very beginning of the story. In fact, there would be no story. It would be a very short book, wouldn't it? Which makes it the grandfather of, of the world's shortest book's jokes, such as this in Faulty Towers. Do you have a, a guide to tell you? A guide? A guide? Um, a guide. Oh dear, I think um, we're out of them again. Oh dear, I think we're out of them again. I've got it in town. Oh, I've got it in town. Oh, I've got it in town. Yes, that's on in talking. Yes, what's yes, on in talking? Yes, one of the world's shortest books. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> one of the world's shortest books. One of the world's shortest like books. Like the uh, wit of Margaret like Thatcher. Like the uh, wit of Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> or great English lovers. Or great oh, English lovers. Oh, very funny, isn't it, Thank you. Okay, so there's a whole uh, little genre of jokes there, of which the second paragraph in Oliver Twist is the kind of origin, the, the grandfather. And again, teacher guidance to make students aware of something like that. Also, when we move into things like the themes, the underlying themes of a novel, uh, the teacher is going to need to point these kinds of things out so that uh, the merging of gender and imperialism in Jane Eyre, the way that Jane's hiding away at the beginning of the book and sitting cross-legged like a Turk, the fact that it's a Turk is something that the reader, the average reader, probably wouldn't focus on very much, especially the non-native reader. But it, it's something that if we focus on it, we can give some, student, some interesting insights to, to students, notably the fact that when John comes and bullies Jane, he is, in turn, compared to the Roman emperors. Now, in fact, in history, the, Roman em the Romans did invade Turkey just as much as John invades Jane's space. So the comparison stands up pretty well. And we've got the passionate Jane, like a little Turk, fighting off John Reed as the cruel slave-driving Roman. It it's a sort of thing that might be worth drawing students' attention to before presenting them with academic papers such as uh, the famous Sultan and the Slave paper. So uh, Joyce Zonana's paper would be something that would be worth presenting students to in order to get them going on that kind of theme so they can do the kind of research that will enable them to produce a decent term paper. And of course, they can use the digital text to find out all the references inside Jane Eyre to slaves. It's one of the huge advantages of digital text that it can be approached in that way and uh, the reader can instantly pick out those kinds of references. So teacher guidance would get the student working in the right kind of way to be able to look at the text and pick out references to slaves and slavery and to find associated research and to understand the way that that theme works in the, no in the novel. Okay, let's wind things up. Basically, reading literature is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be enjoyment. We're not supposed to suffer for it. As William Carlos Williams said, if it ain't a pleasure, it ain't a poem. And I'm sure that Charles Dickens, William Shakespeare, all these people would be very, very upset if they thought that hundreds of years after their death, people on far-flung corners of the planet were being forced to suffer because of what they'd written. That was never the intention. And 
from the point of view of convincing politicians, policymakers, and so forth, I think there's quite a lot to be said for the benefits, the known benefits, the research benefits of reading. In terms of social well being, in terms of mental well being, and in terms of emotional well being. But the bottom line of that is that people are happier and they have a stronger sense of their own identity and how they fit into the world and how they belong because of reading. It's a very big and powerful thing. And in terms of the curriculum, as long as the text is central, then we can relate it to it, the digital context and all of the digital possibilities that, that arise from the study of text. And it can also fit in very nicely with the reading of, that students are doing, the discussion, the research, and the presentation that they make on the basis of all of that. And we need a flexible curriculum so that seminar, workshop, computer room, lecture, are all part of a coordinated syllabus, a coordinated approach based on the study of the text. Well, that's about it. Thank you very much indeed.